All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and I want to thank everybody for being here for this very important debate. This is the much anticipated debate that so many of you have been waiting for. I have Bob Wilkin and Robert Sungenis here with me who will be debating the subject of soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. Tonight, we are answering the question, does the Bible teach salvation by faith alone or salvation by faith plus works? But more specifically, if Romans 2.13 teaches justification before God by works, then the scriptures are self-contradictory and unreliable. I have been extremely excited. I've been pumped for this epic exchange for a while now. But if this is your first time watching a debate on this channel, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. We have now hosted over 180 debates on all sorts of fun and important topics. On Standing for Truth, we strongly believe in critical thinking. And one way we promote critical thinking is by hosting some really awesome debates. This way we can come together and hear both sides of the debate on all kinds of interesting topics. Now, before we get into the debate itself, I first want to thank the debaters, Bob and Robert, for giving us their time for this important debate. And as always, let's kind of break the ice and get to know uh, the debaters a little bit before we get started. Bob and Robert, thanks again for being here. And why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with you, Bob? This is your first time here on, on the platform uh, debating, that is. Uh, how are you? And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about uh, your ministry? Uh, yes, I'm doing well. And uh, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, 1952. I uh, grew up in the Los Angeles area, uh, went to college at UC Irvine came to faith my senior year in college. I had been raised in a sinless perfection holiness group on one half of my family and Orthodox on the other, Serbian Orthodox on the other half. And uh, I came to faith ultimately by being challenged on whether my view of the gospel was possibly wrong and ultimately went to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting and then met with a Campus Crusade staff member for five times and he kept harping on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So I, I came to faith. After that, I, I worked with Campus Crusade for two years at Arkansas State, two years at NC State, met my wife Sharon at Arkansas State, then went to Dallas Seminary and got a master's and doctorate in New Testament, and pastored for a few years, then taught at a college in East Texas, a Bible college, and then was hired by Multnomah School of the Bible, now Multnomah University in Portland, and uh, taught there. And then I started Grace Evangelical Society. And since 1987, I've been heading this ministry, which is dedicated to clarity and evangelism and discipleship. And people can check us out at faithalone.org. Appreciate that introduction there, Bob. I do have <clears throat> your relevant links in the description box for people to check out. Uh, Robert, over to you. Uh, this is your second time here on the channel uh, debating roughly a, a similar topic. How you been? A little bit about yourself, a little bit about your, your ministry. Well, since the last debate here, I've been pretty good. So uh, <laughs> that speaks for itself. Um, I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. I was born in 1955, so I got Bob beat by three years. <laughs> but he's my senior, so I have to respect him. <laughs> um, and I lived a normal Catholic life. And at age 19, um, I had a very intense spiritual experience when I was a freshman at George Washington University. I was a pre-med major. My father's a doctor. I was going to follow his footsteps. The only problem is I couldn't stand the sight of blood, and I hated this, the smell of hospitals. So I don't think I would have been, made a very good doctor. Um, but this experience I had in my freshman dorm all by myself, just reading the Bible, a good news for modern man Bible. Um, and that I read... Um, Matthew 11, 25 to 28, before I went to sleep that night, 
come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know the rest of the verse. And I woke up the next morning and I was a totally different person, totally different. The Holy Spirit had come into my life in a powerful way. I had no intention of having this experience. I had, didn't know anything about, you know, what it was to be other than what I was raised to be. And uh, so from that time forward, I dedicated myself to studying the Bible. I said, if this book can do that to me, um, I want to study this book the rest of my life, which I have done. And um, I went back to the Catholic Church for six months. And things started to make a lot more sense to me than they did before. But I started to listen to Protestant radio preachers, and they were abundant back in the 70s. <laughs> I probably still are. And they were telling me the Catholic Church is all wrong because, you know, too much tradition, too much smells and bells, you know. They don't, And they don't go by the Bible. Let's just put it that way. So I was very naive, didn't know much. I just knew I loved the Lord, and he changed my life, and I wanted to follow the truth wherever it was. So I, I figured, okay, if this guy who's been around so many years knows so much, he seems to know what he's saying. Let me go check it out. So I did for the next 17 and a half years. I became a card carrying Protestant. I was in Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, independent churches, Bible churches. Oh, I think I even tried the Methodists at one point. I don't know. Um, and I ended up uh, graduating from George Washington University, uh, but I did make a pit stop at Washington Bible College in Lanham, Maryland, and I stayed there for a year. And um, then I went to Westminster Theological Seminary, and I graduated there with my master's degree back in the early 80s. And um, around 1992, I had another spiritual experience wherein someone told me that the Catholic Church did go by the Bible. And not only did she go by the Bible, she went by the Bible better than the Protestants do. And so I, I had a challenge before me. No one had ever challenged me with that. And so I accepted the challenge and I studied it. And I knew after just a few days of reading what the Catholics said about the Bible that I wanted to be a Catholic again. So I became a Catholic again in 1992, and I've been one ever since. And I have started a ministry called Catholic Apologetics International that teaches and defends the Catholic faith, basically with the Bible. And that's why I'm here today. Well, Robert, I appreciate that introduction. I also have your uh, relevant links in the description box. So anybody in the audience likes what they're hearing and seeing from the debaters tonight, please check out those links and uh, check out their channels and websites. So what we're gonna do now is just get right into the uh, opening statements. Now, a brief overview on the format uh, for the audience. It is going to be uh, very fast paced. It's I really like this format. We're gonna be having kind of short and sweet opening statements, uh, five minutes with Bob being the affirmative. So he will be uh, starting us off. And then we're going to have about 32 minutes worth of cross-examination. And uh, this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. Then we're going to have an audience Q&A. That's going to go for about 30 minutes. And so uh, the second the opening statements begin, please start tagging me at Standing for Truth with your questions. Uh, then we're going to have uh, four more rounds of cross-examination and then uh, closing statements for a debate. Uh, roughly, we're going to try and keep it about two hours. So uh, with, that, with that being said, Bob, we're going to hand it over to you. And uh, whenever you're ready, whenever you've got your timer going, you have five minutes. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Donnie and Robert and uh, audience. And uh, when we think of Romans 2.13, we need to realize Romans 2.13 2 is part of a context. In fact, it's preceded in verse 12, for as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Then verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, 
that is clearly Paul speaking hypothetically. We know it because in the previous verse, he's already talked about those who sinned without the law and those who sinned in the law. And that's all of us. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And also we know in chapter 3 and verses 27 and 28, Paul says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Also in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, three times Paul says a man is justified by faith in Christ, Three times he says they're not justified by the works of the law, by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. Third, in uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, speaking of regeneration or everlasting life, as verse 5 makes clear, Ephesians 2, 5, he made you alive by grace you've been saved. And then in verse 8, he says, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Fourth, the Lord Jesus in uh, John chapter 5 was correcting uh, Jewish legalists who thought they could go to the Old Testament law and fulfill the Old Testament law and somehow get into the kingdom based on that. And in John 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And then in verse 40, he says, but these are, are they which testify of me but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. In John's gospel, coming to Jesus is believing in him, John 6, 35. The condition we see over and over again, Romans 3, 21 through 31, Romans 4, especially 4 and 5, it's not by works, but it's by faith. It's not an obligation that God pays us. Instead, it's a gift of his grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Galatians 2, 16, John 5, 39, and 40. Also, when Jesus was asked, what works must we do that we may work the works of God? John 6, 28, his answer is kind of ironic. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. The only act we can do to be born again and to have everlasting life is to believe in Jesus. In the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, Peter stood up and said that God had sent him to bring the saving message to Cornelius and his household, to the Gentiles. And he said this was the message of faith alone, apart from works, not any sort of legalistic yoke bearing. Seventh, uh, when Paul was writing to the churches in Galatia, about six months after they had come to faith, he said he was amazed that they were so quickly deserting from the one who called them for a different gospel. And that different gospel in, in the book of Galatians is the message that justification is by faith plus works, precisely the message we're debating today. Paul said that that's a false gospel and it's under God's curse. Uh, and he went on to say that if the readers were to buy into that, then they would fall from the current experience of God's favor or grace in their lives because they were seeking to be justified by law. There are over a hundred verses in the Bible that say justification or regeneration or eternal salvation is by faith alone apart from works. Robert's view today is essentially that justification is by faith plus works, or I should say it's by perseverance in faith plus works, because in his book, Not By Faith Alone, he re repeatedly says that we can lose eternal life and we can lose justification. So if you lack certainty of your eternal destiny, I hope you'll hang on because this debate can give you the certainty that you know where you're going when you die simply by believing the promise of God. Okay, that's five minutes. I appreciate it, Bob. Five minutes on the dot. Okay, we're now going to hand it over to uh, Robert, Robertson Jenis, uh, for your five minute opening statement whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, <clears throat> I will approach this by starting out with Bob's first statement that Romans 2.13 must be hypothetical 
I find that intriguing because uh, James chapter 2, verse 24, speaks about Abraham being justified by works. Just as Romans 2.13 says that the doers of the law will be justified. So they're equal. And it, it's interesting to me that Luther did not like the book of James because of that stipulation and thought it was a, um, a spurious text, he just wanted to get rid of it out of his Bible. And on the other side of the coin, those that don't like Romans 2.13, well, they don't want to eject it from the Bible, so they'll just say, well, it's hypothetical. So I see two approaches to this that's basically saying, you know, we don't have to deal with this because it's either not in the Bible or it's hypothetical. Uh, that, to me, is not the way to understand God's word. I just think that is um, an amateurish kind of, um, you know, if I can't have it my way, well, let's just get rid of the passage somehow and, and, and go to the other passages that we like that speak our language. That's what it seems to me. This is what I loved about the Catholic Church. You come to the Catholic Church and no passage of Scripture is hypothetical. No passage of Scripture is said not to be in the canon of Scripture. We just take it as it is. And I don't see that happening here, at least not yet. Um, when we look at the context of Romans 2, yeah, Romans 2.12 says, whether you're in the law or out of the law, you will be judged. I would expect that. Those who sin without the law are going to be judged. Those who sin in the law will be judged. That's Paul's point. And that's why he says in verse 13 that only the doers of the law, whether you're in the law or out of the law, it doesn't make any difference. If you've sinned, you're going to be judged. So only the doers of the law, whether they do it in the law or out of the law, those are the ones that are going to be justified. It makes perfect sense. Okay, so I don't see any difficulty in this passage at all. When we compare Romans 2.13 to other passages that Paul wrote, like 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, which says, All men shall stand before the judgment seat of God to be judged uh, uh, by their works, whether them good or done bad, and will be uh, appropriately punished or rewarded. Okay, so this is not out of the ordinary for Paul. He does the same thing in Romans 14, 10, saying that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ or God, whatever text you have. Same thing, okay? Re um, Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12 says we will be judged for our works. So this whole idea of be about being judged for works or justified by works is not a foreign idea to the New Testament. It's all over the New Testament. Of course, different people have their different ways of dealing it. Like, you know, we'll say 2 Corinthians 5, 10, all that deals with our rewards. Well, that's not what the context says. The context is talking about judgment for your sin. Unless you want to show me someplace that sins are, um, that bad works are not sins. If you can do that, then I'll come on your side. Okay. The, the larger context here, how, how much time do I have, uh, Donnie? Good question. You have exactly a minute, Robert. Okay. So the larger question here is, why is Paul saying this to the Jews? Well, the Jews thought that they were owed salvation from God because they were the seed of Abraham. And the Gentiles were scum. The Jews had it made. And basically, God, they didn't have to do anything special. They were owed salvation. And Paul says, no. You think God owes you something? God doesn't owe you a thing. So if you try to use the law, obey the law, and, and put God in debt, this is what he says in Romans 4, verse 4. If you try to put God in debt, you will never be justified. Okay? And that's exactly what the Jews were trying to do. So this is the whole context of Romans 2 and 3, telling the Jew that salvation is not owed to him because he's Jewish. Okay? And then he uses the Gentiles as his goad against them, saying, look, there's even Gentiles who obey the law, and when they do, they will be justified. So now what do you Jews have to say? And then Paul goes on with his argument in the next chapters. Okay, perfect timing as well. That's five minutes. 
short and sweet opening statements. And uh, looks like we've got questions flying in as well. So I do want to encourage uh, people to make sure they're tagging me. We've got uh, over 100 people already in the chat. So please tag me at Standing for Truth. That way I won't miss it. Okay, we're going to hand it uh, now to Bob. This is the first round of uh, cross-examination, four minutes. And uh, Bob, you're going to lead the way for the first four minutes. Gentlemen, go ahead. Okay, very good. Um, Robert, if you were to die tonight, are you certain that you would go to be in the presence of the Lord? Um, Bob, you know how many times I've been asked that question. I know it's the favorite question of non-Catholics to the Catholics. And the question assumes that you know that if you die tonight, you would go to heaven. Uh, and let me just say, you don't know that, although you think you know that, because you've studied the Bible in a certain way, and you interpret it such that if you die tonight, because you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. But I can tell you here, sitting here, you don't know. So I will answer the question by saying that it's a fallacious question. It's a hypothetical question. It's a question that is that it follows the a logical fallacy of petitio principi, which is using as proof the very thing you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that someone who dies goes to heaven. You haven't proven that yet. So when you can prove that, then you can ask me the question. And all I'm trying to do is ask you the question. And you know, I know from your book that you say that Catholicism teaches certainty is impossible, correct? Certainty about what? about your eternal destiny, that you will have final salvation, what you call final salvation? Well, Catholicism teaches that you can be certain if you are in a state of grace. But the question is, are you in a state of grace? Some people think they're in the state of grace and they think they could go to heaven, but they may not be. Okay, Robert, are so, you in a state of grace right now? Yes, I am. So therefore, if you died tonight, you would go to be with the Lord. That's right. Okay, so you're certain. Well, as certain as I can be, yes. What, what, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a finite man, and I am as certain as I can be about things that are not um, absolute. Uh, you're in the same boat as I am. Okay, when Jesus says, whoever believes in him shall not perish but has everlasting life, is that true or false? That's, that's well, from my vantage point, it's true. Okay. And are you one who believes in Jesus? Yes. So what do we know is must be true of you? I'm sorry? What do we know must be true of you if he says, whoever believes in him will not perish? And you said you believe in him. So what do I know must be true of you if you believe in Jesus? That I will not perish. Right. So you should be certain, right? I just answered that question for you. I just said I, I'm as certain as I can be, being a finite man, and the same goes for you. Is Jesus a finite man? Jesus a finite man. Well, he, Jesus has a human nature, and his human nature is now infinite in the sense that he's going to live forever. Okay, so when he says something, it's true. I have no questions about that. So when he says whoever believes in him will not perish— that's true. So what you're ultimately saying is you don't know if you believe in him. No, I know I believe in him. The question is, will I continue to believe until the day I die? That's okay. that's what the Catholics are trying to tell you. Okay, in John eleven twenty six, 26, he says, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. What does that mean? Uh, that's in the chapter dealing with the resurrection of Lazarus. Right. So in that sense, he, he is transformed from the life that he has in uh, as a Christian, and he will continue that life in eternity. Okay, so if he's never going to die, then he's eternally secure. No, see, Bob, you're trying to do the same thing. You're just using a different passage to try to say the same thing. I'm going to give you the same answer, okay? The answer is Jesus is correct. Jesus is true. Whether that applies to uh, various individuals who claim it, for example, you claim it, but I don't know if it's true for you. You can think that you're saved. You can think that you've interpreted all these passages correctly, 
but you may be entirely wrong. Okay. Let me ask you this. You said you spoke about uh, the justification of Abraham. When was he justified before God, according to scripture? And before you answer, Robert, I just want to say yeah. that's four minutes. So Robert will give you a time oh, to answer sorry, and then we'll change it. Oh, no, oh, that's completely fine. We'll just make that the last question, Robert, if you want to quickly answer, and then we'll, we'll do the next four minutes. Okay. Um, Abraham's justification. Well, that's a big topic. So let me turn the tables and I want to ask you. Okay. When uh, Abraham was justified. Well, according to James chapter 2 and verse 23, when James quotes Genesis 15, 6, it's when he believed God. Paul says the same thing in Romans 3, and he says the same thing in Galatians 3. So he was justified, Genesis 15, 6, when he was 75, and he offered up Isaac when he was 100, 25 years later. And so the, the passage you cited in James 2, 21 is referring to his vindication before men, not before God. All right. So we got two problems here. One is that James 2, 21 to 24 is citing Genesis 15, 6, but it's referring to Abraham's justification in Genesis 22 when he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Okay, that's one for the first thing we need to fix. Uh, I'm not denying that Genesis 15, 6 is a justification of Abraham. But what I will conclude from James 2 is that Abraham had at least two justifications. One in Genesis 15, 6 from where he quotes, and the second in Genesis 22 when he sacrificed Isaac. Because that's what makes James conclude in, Genesis, in um, James 2, 24, a man is... Um, justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay. Now, the other thing is you're saying that Abraham is vindicated. Uh, the Greek word here is not vindicated. The, the, Greek, the Greek word, that's your English translation because that fits in nice with your theology. The word is dikaiosune, uh, either righteousness or dikaio, which is always translated justify. Now let's just say that we were to, um, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna pose this question to you. Let's just say, Bob, that we were going to take your tra English translation, vindicated, and put that in uh, James two twenty four, and here's how it would read: Abraham, um, a man is just is vindicated by works and not by faith alone. A man is vindicated by works and not by faith alone. Now, can you make sense out of that for me? Yeah. Well, first of all, in this context, we're talking about dikaiao, the verb for to justify. And uh, that word, when it's referring to justification before God, refers to being declared righteous. Although I know in your book you say it's God making us righteous. But having said that, uh, when it's referring to before men, then it is being declared righteous before men, which I would translate as vindication. You no, see, Bob, you're not answering my question. Okay, what was the my question? My question is, can you make sense out of this sentence? A man is vindicated by works and not by faith alone. Well, actually, the Greek there, the last word alone is monon, which is an adverb. And it should say a man is justified by works and not only by faith. And yeah. I, would, I would agree with you. There's two justifications. Abraham was justified in Genesis 15, 6 before God. He was justified in Genesis 22, 9 through 18 before men. Uh, how do you figure? There weren't any men when he was sacrificing Isaac. Well, let's see. Right now, he's considered the father, father of Judaism, the father of Islam, and the father of Christianity. I would say in the world, the vast majority of people think that Abraham was a righteous man. I'm not concerned about what the world thinks, Bob. I'm concerned about what you think. Tell yeah, me I, which, I, tell I me which, which men were there when Abraham was sacrificing Isaac before God. It was God who said, now I know that you trust me when Abraham sacrificed Isaac. There wasn't any men there saying, oh, now we know that you have works, Abraham. I misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking why James put it in James chapter two. No, you okay. said that this was a justification before men. 
that James is talking about. You I think there were no there were thinking. no men at the mountain where Abraham was sacrificing Isaac. So it wasn't a justification before men. Well, we all believe in young earth creationism and only Adam and Eve were in the garden. Does that mean we shouldn't believe in young earth creationism? Uh, Bob, I and, have. and with that, actually, let me jump in. That's just about 20 seconds over. The four minutes are flying by. Why don't we uh, make that, um, either we can make that the first question for the next round. Now we're going to have Bob uh, lead the way for four minutes. Fantastic job so far, uh, gentlemen. And go ahead. This is the next uh, four minute round. Bob leading the way. All right. Um, if an adult is baptized in the Catholic Church, is that person justified? Yes. Okay. Now, according to your book, in order to be justified, you say it is not a legal righteousness, it is a godly righteousness. You say that justification, page 321 of Not By Faith Alone, is God instilling righteousness in us. How could a brand new person who's just been baptized be declared righteous when he does not yet have any godly righteousness, which is, you say it's not legal, right? This is an actual righteousness. So how does this baptized adult Catholic, how does he have actual righteousness? Well, unlike your religion, Bob, um, we believe that in baptism, as the fathers of the church all believed in consensus, it's baptismal regeneration. It's not just getting wet with water as a symbol that somehow I believed in Jesus. And in baptismal regeneration, the soul is renewed. The soul was dead. Now the soul is renewed. That's a vital part of my essential being, my soul. Uh, if my soul is now alive, that means I have true righteousness. Uh, as opposed to the idea that you believe, which is I still remain the same dirty, rotten sinner, but I have this covering over me uh, by the merits of Christ that God looks at instead of me, and somehow that justifies me. The Catholics say no. We're, we don't believe justification is a fiction. We believe it's real. So when God says, I have justified you, or you are just, or you are righteous, as he says to David in the Psalms, he is really righteous because God changed his soul. Okay, on page 270 of Not By Faith Alone, you say that uh, only God is the ultimate judge of whether a person has done the three things necessary to be justified. And you say the three kinds of the three things a person must do are number one, they must have the kind of faith that is required. Number two, you say they must have the quality of faith that is required. And number three, you say they must have the quality of works that are required. And so if only God can determine these things, how would it be possible for you to say that you're certain you know you're going to be in the kingdom someday? Well, because God works through the church and gives the church uh, the authority to tell me that uh, I am... Um, how, how you put it, how did you put it, I'm going to go to heaven if I'm in a state of grace, as I said before. So it's through the church that I know these things, and the church is the interpreter of the official interpreter of scripture, and that's how God disseminates the information to me. It's through the church. Okay, so how many people, how many Roman Catholics are there in the world today? Uh, over a billion, I believe. Okay, and are all those billion in a state of grace? No. Okay, now you say the Catholic Church tells you you're in a state of grace. How does it tell you specifically that you're in a state of grace when it doesn't tell all billion Catholics they're in a state of grace? Well, it's told these Catholics who I say some of are not in a state of grace, that if they sin, then they're not in a state of grace. That is a moral sin. And many of them are in moral sin, like Nancy Pelosi, for example. Okay, so uh, she may think she's on her way to heaven, but the church just barred her from communion. So that's an example of the church telling her that, no, you're not on your way to heaven. You're on your way to hell. OK, so do you want me to go further? Well, no, I guess what you're saying is if a person has not been barred from communion in the Catholic Church, then they're on their way to heaven. No, I'm just saying that's one example. You asked me for how to illustrate it. I illustrated it for you. There are many different kinds of sins people commit that bar them from the kingdom of heaven, as the Gospels tell us. 
Okay, I've got another one. On page 214, you say, quote, salvation is not based merely on an act of faith at the beginning of one's life, but on continual faith and obedience throughout one's life. A minute ago, you were saying, wait a minute, we can know right now we're in a state of grace, we're going to make it. But no, here you say we must have continual faith and continual obedience. Can you be sure you're going to have continual faith and obedience? Oh, I, I was very clear on that to you before, Bob. I said the, the, the thing that I am not sure about is whether I will continue in my faith and works. I know now that I'm in a state of grace, but I don't know that in the future because I sin of my own free will. And if I do that, I'm responsible for my sins. Okay, that's four minutes. Moving into round four. Uh, flying by. Great discussion so far. Uh, Robert, you get to lead the way. Four minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Bob, you had um, said that you agreed that Abraham was justified under the language that James used in James 2, 21 to 24. Is that correct? Correct. Twice. Okay. You also said that James, as he quotes from Genesis 15, 6, as Paul does in Romans 4, to uh, pinpoint another justification of Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 6. Okay. So are you telling us that you believe in two justifications of Abraham? I do. Okay. So is that not the same thing as what I believe? in the Catholic Church, which says that as I continue to produce my faith in works, I continue to increase in my justification. Until no, no, because I see Abraham's justification as one before God and two before men. Yeah, and Bob, but you haven't proven that it's before men. Show, well, me that, show me that it's before men and use the example that I gave you from Genesis 22 and show me where the men are. There's three of them here on the screen, and there's untold how many watching, and that'll watch later. And every Muslim, every Catholic, every person in Protestantism, Orthodox, they all look to Abraham, and they all say that Abraham was justified when he offered up Isaac. That is, he was vindicated before us when he offered up uh, him. And the the Jewish people say this as well. So your point about people needing to be present, I don't understand because if something is written in Scripture, well, then that influences everybody who ever reads Scripture. Bob, if that was true, I could say the same thing about Genesis 15, 6, because that shows he has faith. And everybody in the world knows that Abraham had faith in Genesis 15, 6. So that's before men, too, according to your definition. Uh, well, of course. Why wouldn't it be? Well, because you just told me that it was before God. No, he was justified before God, but men know about it by reading the scriptures. Oh, okay. So so, so he's not justified before men, and that's why you have to switch to the word vindicated, which I is why to, I hold on, I don't have to switch which to is why I pose this sentence to you. If vindicated is the interpretation we're supposed to get from the Greek verb dikaio in James 2:24, then Explain this sentence to me. A man is just is vindicated by works and not by faith alone or faith only, whatever you want at the end of the sentence. Explain that to me. Well, I would say that the issue is what you understand by justification. You understand it as God making us righteous. No, I understand Bob, Bob, it as God. I am not going there, Bob. I'm asking you using your own word, vindicated, put it back into James 2.24 and then ex exegete James 2.24 for me. I didn't say I would translate James 2.24 as vindicate. I said that- But that you have to, Bob, because you just told me that the word dikaio means vindicated well, in James 2.24. First of all, it's Okay, dikaio. let's give Bob the last 25 seconds, Bob, to uh, right. answer that question. Go ahead, then we'll move on. Well, first of all, it's dikaio, not dikaio. But secondly, the the word means to be declared righteous. And no, if you're doesn't. declared righteous before, okay, well, then that's part of this debate, isn't it? It is, Bob. Uh, and you're, if you're the one who used the word vindicated. God, that's vindicated does not mean declared righteous. Okay. 
So that's a whole other topic, and that's what I'm going to deal with right now. And I just want to I want to stick to the format. So let's um, give Bob the final word for this round, and then and then we're going to have Bob lead the way. So Bob, if there's anything, any final points you wanted to make on this round, go ahead, and then we're going to move to the next. I'm round. sorry, I missed this. What are we doing now? For this round, I wanted to just make sure that that we're sticking to format. You can have the final word if if there's any final points you wanted to make on uh, Robert's okay. question there. Well, all I was going to say is that uh, the the verb means to declare righteous, and God declares people righteous when they believe in Christ, and humans declare people righteous when they live righteously. And I call humans declaring people righteous vindication. If Robert wants to call God declaring people righteous vindication before God, I'm okay with that too. Okay, appreciate that. That's round. Uh, that's round four. So now we're moving into uh, round five. Bob, you get to lead the way, gentlemen. The floor is yours. Okay, on page seventeen of Not by Faith Alone, here's your definition of faith: quote, an act performed within the mind and heart of one who willingly assents to understand the nature of God and what He requires of man. So I don't understand what that means. What do you mean by he willingly assents to understand the nature of God and what he requires of man? Well, that means he uses his free will to believe what God has said about the nature of man and that he's a sinner and that he needs grace, God's grace, in order to be saved from that sin. So he assents to what God says about him and he believes it. And he did this of his own free will. And you say, and what he requires of man. So what does he require of man? I just said it. He requires man to believe in him and to obey his law. Wait a minute. No, I don't think you said obey his law. But okay, so you're saying it means to believe and obey. Correct. Is that correct? Believe and obey. Okay. In in John eleven twenty six, Jesus says, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? Could you put your definition of believe into John eleven twenty six 26 and explain what he's asking Martha? Do you believe this? Uh, first of all, Bob, you're taking it out of context and you're trying to make a theological definition fit into an historical context is talking about the raising of the dead. All right. I'm not going to go there. OK, I'm just telling he, Martha and Mary. I'm sorry. Mary believes that Lazarus will be raised on the last day. That's what this conversation started out to be in the earlier verses. He even asks her, do you believe this, Mary? She says, yes, I do believe it, that he will be raised on the last day. She's the one that offered the last day. So they're talking about a bodily resurrection there. All right. So let's not confuse the issue by trying to take my theological definition and jamming it into an historical time context where it may or may not fit. Okay, let's go back to John eleven twenty five. 25. In verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. What death is he talking about in verse 25? He who believes in me, though he may die. In the context, he's talking about the bodily death. Okay, and what kind of life is he talking about? He shall live. In the life of that God's going to give us in eternity in heaven. That's that's the ultimate life. Okay. Uh, since he's talking about I am the resurrection, I would say that verse 25 is talking about resurrection. But you said verse 26 is talking about resurrection. But notice he goes on to say, and he who lives and believes in me shall never die. What kind of death is that? Well, that's a, talking about a different topic. The same one John 5, 25 is talking about. He who hears me will live. Uh, and then in John um, um, 5, he goes on to say that he will never die. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about his soul. That is his soul that was regenerated will never die because it has received the life of the gospel. And he will go on into, etern into et heaven in his soul existence while his body goes into the grave. So in that sense, he will never die. His body did die, and his body now is being has to wait until it's raised on the last day and then be united with its soul that is now in heaven, and he will be one whole personality at the so, end of time. 
So when he then asked Martha, do you believe this? Is he asking her about her obedience or is he asking her if she's convinced what he just said is true? It's obvious, Bob, that he's asking her whether she believes it. Well, but you already defined belief as including obeying God's commands. Does no, it? I did not, Bob. You did. Okay. I this did? is what okay. you were trying to do. You're trying to buttonhole me and get your own definition of what you think I believe. And then you're going to jam it into a passage of scripture and say, well, Bob, see, you're contradicting the passage of scripture. I'm not going to play that game, Bob. Okay. All I was quoting is you saying what God, faith is what God requires of man. And you said that was faith plus obedience. But people can listen back to two minutes ago when you said that, but that's okay. Uh, I've got a, I, let's see, do I have another minute? Yep. You uh, got time, I would say, for one or two more questions. All Go right. Ahead. Can you, uh, how many times did the woman at the well need to drink the living water before she would never thirst again? How many drinks? Well, initially one when she met Jesus, and then she's going to have to continue to drink from it because the woman at the well may fall into sin and and not be uh, able to go to heaven. So she's going to have to drink of it again, just like David committed sin with Bathsheba and lost his justification. And Paul says he got it back when he repented of his sin. So like I said before, Bob, nobody knows the future. You never know what's going to happen to you. And that's why you have to uh, keep drinking from the water, not just drink it once and think that, oh, that's all you have to do. Once well, saved, always saved. Keep in mind, Jesus said they'll never thirst again. And he said one drink and she understood it that way. But that's what this debate's about. So I'll drop it there. Yeah. Well, see, there's a, it's my turn now, uh, Donnie. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Round six looks like. All right. right. So what, what I see happening here, Bob, is that you like to twist the scriptures to the way you think they should be interpreted without looking at the context. And I think that's the fault of a lot of the uh, Protestant way of looking at the Bible. Uh, I think the perfect example of that was how you have become so evasive when I asked you to exegete James 2.24, uh, which you said, the, the word dikaio there means uh, vindicated. And I said, okay, well then exegete this passage for me. Very simple question to you. And you hemmed and hauled and you went around, well, they're talking about the Muslims and all this stuff. Everybody believes, you know, Abraham did this. That's not what I'm asking you. And you know it. Would you like me to exegete the passage? Yeah. Whole, I can exegete the whole passage. James 2. I want you to exegete it by putting the word vindicated in the passage, because that's what you said the word dikaio meant. Okay, so do that for us. Uh, if I translate it that way, which I wouldn't, I would say, you see that a man is vindicated by works and he's not only vindicated by faith. Okay, well, to where vindication. does the Bible teach that a man is vindicated by faith? Uh, that would be Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4. That would be... Where does he use the word vindicated? Show me. Well, I, I assume you know the New Testament was not written in English. Yes. It was written Vindicated in does not mean justified. You well, know that. I know that. If you want to look it up in BDAG, you will find out that one of the meetings of Dikaio is vindication. Yeah. And so why do you think you can use it in James 2.24? Only because it fits your theology. That's why. There's no, nobody told you that this word like means vindicated. Look, justification fits just as well. You want to translate it in verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works, and he's not only justified by faith. That's, That's two the way you read it. One before God, one before man. And by uh, the way, tell me know, where there's a distinction between Abraham's belief in Genesis 15, 6, that you say is before God, yeah. and the one in James 2, 24, that you say is before men. And yet there are no men there on the mount. You still haven't answered that question, Bob. I think I did. It's 25 years. I don't understand what Abraham you're saying. Abraham was 75 when he was justified before God, Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4, Galatians 3, and also James 1, uh, James chapter 2. But he was 100 when he was justified before men. So what? Uh, what makes a difference? You said, why are they years? different? They're different by 25 years and they're different audiences. 
where is the audience of men when Abraham is on the mountain sacrificing Isaac? Well, the audience of men uh, yeah. is all people who ever read the account. Oh, yeah. Well, the same goes for Genesis 15, 6. I can read the account and I can say, okay, I'm a witness. So I'm the man witness to Abraham's initial belief, as you say. So you're trapped, Bob. You're trapped. If you want to use the word justification in J James 2, 24, then you have to show us how being justified by works does, is not totally contrary to your whole scheme of, of theology. After all, you're the one who said Romans 2.13, if it's true, then that then the Bible contradicts itself. Well, now you just said that James 2.24 contradicts the Bible because you just used the word justified when you said Let's a just man make is sure justified we're getting a question by works. Too, Robert. A man yep. is justified by works. Well, I think there's a little bit of a question in there. And let me say that one of the things you didn't point out is that in James 2.13, it talks about not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. In the sight of God. You don't find that in James 2 when he's talking about Rahab being justified when she saved the spies or when Abraham offered up Isaac. And so if you want to talk about two different contexts, there's two different contexts. One is talking about justification in the sight of God. The other doesn't say that. So now you're telling me, Bob, that you believe Romans 2.13 is correct because it uses in the sight of God? Oh, well, Romans 2.13 has, has to be correct. Of course it's well, correct. Wait a minute. The resolution says that it can't be correct. And if it is, then the Bible contradicts itself. No, of course it's correct. Robert, if you live a perfect life, then you will be justified. If and you that's not sin once in your entire life, you will be justified. That's no, what that's not what the that's not what the passage says. That's what Romans two thirteen says. Romans two thirteen says the doers of the law will be justified. It doesn't say that if I commit a sin, then I'm going to miss out on that justification. Okay, so because the Bible also talks about forgiveness for sin. Okay, God's the forgiver. As a matter of fact, in verse four of that very chapter, he talks about the kindness and mercy of God upon mankind. And that that allows him to forgive men of his sin, but still require him to obey the law. OK, let's allow Bob to answer that. And then we're going to go into round seven. Bob, go ahead. Uh, take your time to answer that. And then we're going to move to the next round. Uh, I don't. I didn't hear a question there, so I don't know what I'm supposed to answer. If if there's anything you'd like to just it's address, a challenge. There, feel take free it to as do a challenge, that. Bob. I mean, I, I there's so much confusion here. You're it, conflating forgiveness of sins with justification. Those are not the same thing. Uh, that's how we get justified by having our sins forgiven. No, we get justified by God declaring us righteous. Oh yeah. And we also get regenerated by God, the Holy Spirit, giving us everlasting life. But your idea that somehow we're getting this by forgiveness, okay, fine. But now we can go into a whole separate discussion of forgiveness of sins and your view of confessing your sins to the priest and also doing acts of penance. And we can get into my doctoral dissertation on repentance if you want, but I don't think you want to go there either. But let's go to a few other questions. Um, when, when Jesus says, he who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst, John 6, 35, what does that mean? What do those figures of speech mean? Never hunger, never thirst. It means that you're never going to hunger again for righteousness. As Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger after righteousness. You come to Jesus, he gives you uh, your hunger stops because now you have the righteousness and you will stay in that righteousness as long as you uh, continue to have faith and obey. It's very simple. I know, but he says never hunger. And you're saying you will hunger again. Uh, Bob, it's a figure of speech that Jesus is using there. OK, never hunger. He's taught he's projecting into the future when he sees all of the believers gather together in heaven, of course, there, that's when we're never going to hunger. That's the ultimate salvation, as you well know. Prior to that, 
you're going to fall, I'm going to fall. And we're going to need the mercy of God again. And so we're going to hunger after that righteousness again. Okay? That's what he means. That's, that's of course, not what he says, but okay. Uh, no. let's, let's move on to another one. What passage in the Bible tells you everything we need to do in order to be justified or regenerate? What passage would you go to? There is no one passage. This okay. is the problem that you, you guys have. You think you're going to find it in one passage, and that's all you have to do is look at this one passage and that's it. No, this is why you can't understand that Romans 2.13 is not hypothetical because you take it out of the text because you've already decided that Romans 3 is the most important passage of the Bible or Romans 4. And so Romans 2 has to take the back seat. That's not what we do in Catholicism. We interpret all of them together to come up to a unified whole of interpretation where one passage does not contradict the other. Okay, so if there is no one passage, how do you piece this mosaic together to come up with what we need to do? How, how did you come up with this? Or did the Catholic Church come up with this? Yeah, the Catholic Church came up with it. It's called the seven sacraments. One is the, the first and most important is baptism. Uh, that's what cleanses your soul and renews you in the Holy Spirit uh, and takes away the sin from Adam. And allows you now to lead a life of holiness and obedience before God. And then if you falter in that, then you have the sacrament of penance. And God will forgive your sins and give you the grace to try again and keep on trying until the day you die. Then you have the Holy Eucharist, which is the means of God giving you the grace to continue on obeying him and having faith. And then you have this, the sacrament of confirmation, which strengthens you by the Holy Spirit so that you can continue on in the life of obedience and faith to God and so on and so on. OK, well, it's it. I think it's sad that you don't have any passage of Scripture that tells you. And when Paul's asked, what must I do to be saved? The answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you must be saved is an insufficient answer. And of course, when the Lord is talking to the woman at the well or John uh, uh, Nicodemus, those are insufficient answers. You don't have any specific passage. It's kind of difficult. We got to go to the seven sacraments, but okay. Well, wait a minute. In Acts chapter 16, where that is occurring, Paul says, yes, to the jailer who asked him the question, what must I do to be saved? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Okay. Then what happens? Then Paul says, all right, now we need to baptize you. Okay, now, now mind you, this is like two o'clock in the morning. This is a soldier that uh, has responsibility for his prisoners, and yet he's taking the risk now to go get baptized. Right at the same time, Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. So apparently it wasn't just believing. The belief led to baptism, which I just talked about as a sacrament of the Catholic Church that starts you out on the path. So, Bob, it looks like Act 16 is requiring more than you're requiring because it's requiring baptism. You're only requiring the, the jailer to believe. Bob, let's do one final follow up and then we're going to move to the next round. Go ahead, Bob. OK. All I would say is when Paul was Paul's answer was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He didn't say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and you will be saved. And uh, Robert, quick final word, then we're going to we're going to give it to you to lead the way. So Paul requires things of the jailer, but they're not really required. Right, Bob? He just has to believe. So Paul was really out of line in asking him to be baptized. Right. Is that what you're telling us? No, what I'm trying to tell you is God requires thousands of things from the believer, but only one thing to have everlasting life, and that's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But once, yeah. you're, once you're born again, there's thousands of commands. Yeah, but you don't know you're going to have eternal life until the day you die. If, 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 and, if and when you do reach heaven, that's a not, a not a given, okay? Belief starts you out. As a matter of fact, that's what the Catholic Church says. In ca Canon um, um, Chapter 5 of the Council of Trent, Session 6, it says, faith is the beginning of salvation. Okay? So it, under it understands what's being said in, in Acts 16.31, but that's not all. 
There are many more things that are going to be required, and Paul required one of them. It was right there, right then and there, it was baptism. So it must be very important. If you wanted to get a question in there, uh, Robert, then we'll allow Bob to respond. We got four minutes for the final round here. Oh, it's final round. So I get one more, and he gets one more? No, nope, it'll be the final round. So uh, Bob started, round. and then you'll end it. Okay. So, Bob, let me go back to Abraham again. Um, in Abraham, in, in Genesis 22, I think it's verse 9, um, the angel comes down after Abraham had attempted to sacrifice Isaac and says, now I know that um, you um, believe in me and abide in me. I forget the exact words he used there. Um, so tell me where the men are that are witnessing this act of Abraham. Are there any men or not at this point? Isaac's there. Abraham's there. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank and you. And I Mark. believe the Lord Jesus Christ is there. Oh, okay. Well, he's God. Okay. So you're just saying the same thing that I've been saying. There well, are no, me there are no and, men there. He's God and man. And he was present, I believe, in bodily form as an angel, as the angel of the Lord there. Oh, okay. But, he, but he's still God. Okay. So you said it was all before men, but it, it's not. You, you you made this grand distinction between being before God and being before men. Now no, you're no, telling me no, now no. you're telling me that Jesus that. is God and man, so that serves a double purpose. I uh, didn't say that confused. this event took place before men. What I said is this is justification before men. Yeah, that's what I said. Right. So I, I puzzled then why you use the word vindicated then. Because when you speak of being declared righteous by men in English, that is being vindicated by men. Oh, really? Do you have a, do you have a chapter and verse that proves that? No, I don't. Okay, all right. So it's just your own thoughts, then, Bob. You you can you are constantly switching back from vindicated to justif justified because you really haven't grappled with the historical context of the passage, which. Tell me, Robert, did you take any Greek at all in your Westminster uh, career? Yeah, Bob, I had four years of Greek, and I've been studying Greek ever since. Okay? okay, so you've got all this Greek, and yet you can't pronounce Greek words correctly. Yeah, and... well, sometimes I get the accent wrong, Bob. Okay, forgive me, but at least I got the theology right. Well, I would say you've missed the theology, but here's my concern. My hey, concern it's my is, turn. It's my turn to, okay. to cross-examine you. Okay. okay. But if you would ask me a question, it'd make it easier. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go back to Romans 2.13. That's the whole reason we are um, here in this debate. And it says the doers of the law will be justified. Now, is that uh, before God? So I'm going to take your addition there and I'm going to ask you again. Is this passage possible to be uh, executed by a man? Uh, it says in Romans 2.13, not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. But the doers of the law. So is that a true statement or not? It's true that if a person could do that, he would be justified before God. But there is no, no such person. How do you know? How do I know? Because Romans chapter 3, verses 27 and 28 says there is no such. Romans 3.23 says there is no such person. Uh, no. Galatians 2.23 no and following says that a person will not be justified by the works of the law in a context of Jews who thought that they could be justified by doing works of the law and not loving God, following God. They just thought the, the works were it. All you had to do was the works. Okay, so there we can understand why works won't justify, because they're using works to obligate God because they're the seed of Abraham. Okay? But you're not, you're not using works to obligate God. That's right, exactly right. Okay, so you yeah. would have no ground for boasting because you had gracious merit. Robert, well, let's do one I'm more just, question for Bob, and then that, and then that wraps the four minutes. Okay. I'm sorry. Where are we at now? 
I was going to say you have time for one more question for Bob. We'll let Bob respond. Then we're going to get into. Okay, uh, Bob, is it possible for someone to be um, accepted for someone's works to be accepted by God through God's grace? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by accepted by God. Acts okay. 35 says whoever yeah. works, works righteousness is acceptable to God. And okay. what that's talking about is, in my estimation, that if anyone is doing righteous works, God is going to respond and give them the revelation about Christ. Whatever. What I'm asking you is, can God's grace accept someone's works without condemning those works? Let's put it that way. Uh, are you asking if a person could be justified by works before God? Uh, no, I'm not asking that yet. Okay, I'm asking, you're asking if, a, if a justified person can be rewarded for his works, the answer is yes. Okay. And let's say that reward was salvation. Well, it couldn't be because right. Romans 4, 4, and 5 says that if it was a wage, then it wouldn't be grace. And that's exactly why I'm saying grace, Bob. I didn't say a wage. I said, if God's grace can accept the man's works to give him a reward, is that true? You said yes. And I said, well, what if the reward was salvation? That doesn't mean we're back to a wage. It means we're still in the same grace. Well, I mean, we were talking about the word reward, which you, I'm sure, know is the word misthos. And yeah. the word misthos is used in Romans 4, 4, and that's why I was talking about it. He says in verse 4, to the one, now to the one who works, the wages, that is the rewards, are not counted as grace, but as debt. That's misthos. That's rewards there. Yeah, well, misthos is used in many different ways, as you used yourself when you talked about reward. You're not using it in a judgmental sense and when you used it five minutes ago. It's, it's a word that depends on its context, okay? So the, so the question still holds to you, Bob. Can the reward be salvation and yet God give it by grace to the works that you've done? No, and, it's, and, it's a gift. It's not a reward. Well, that's what grace is, Bob. It's a gift, okay? We're not talking about a wage here. Gift, okay, Bob, grace, whatever go. word you want to use. Okay, okay Bob, got, let's have a final response, then we'll move right, on. My final response would be, I find this confusing because you say people can't be saved by Jewish works, but they can be saved by Catholic works. No, I didn't say that. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Okay, I gentlemen, let me, let me just jump in they here. They could be saved by their works because they were the children of Abraham. That's what I said. Okay, so I'm going to jump in here. Um, great but first 32 minutes for the cross exam, we're going to engage the audience for 30 minutes now. I've got about enough questions to keep us busy until tomorrow, same time. So I hope you guys are ready for an all nighter. Uh, what I'll do is pick out the most relevant questions to the debate, uh, mm -hmm. especially questions relating to points you discussed. And then looking at the format we agreed upon, we'll have. Um, Four more rounds of cross-exam, which will be about 16 minutes, and then and then we'll kind of wrap it up with closing statements. So here we go. First uh, question, and I'll put them up on screen, uh, Bob and Robert, just to make it easy for us. And uh, we're going to do our best to keep each question to max, uh, let's say, three minutes, so whoever the question is for. Although we have a lot of questions for uh, just the both of you. So then we'll be dealing with two minutes then. So this one uh, comes in from Brandon. Uh, short and sweet here. Can both exegete James 2? And uh, it's for both of you. So why don't we start um, with Bob, I guess, since he's the affirmative, and then we'll we'll hand it to Robert. So uh, let's try and keep it to a minute. Gentlemen and Bob, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, James 2, 1 through 13 is talking about how we should treat the poor and the rich the same in our assemblies. James 2, 14 through 26 continues this theme and says, if a brother or sister in your assembly is without proper food or clothing and you say, be filled and we warmed and you give them nothing for it, what use is that? The Greek is tita aphelos at the beginning of verse 14 and the end of verse 16. And it means, what is the prophet? So when he says faith without works is dead in 2.17, 2.20 and 2.26, he means 
Faith without works is useless. It's unprofitable. It will not profit the believer who has the means to help the needy believer but doesn't do it, nor will it help the needy believer. That's why it's mentioned in both verse 14 and in verse 16. And the point of discussing Abraham is to show that if we put our faith to work, then we are going to be people who are vindicated or justified before men and that that's well known. And as we look at Abraham or even Rahab the harlot, we recognize that those people put their faith into practice. James 2.14 says we're to do. Okay, perfect. Right on the one minute mark. I understand the one minute um, certainly flies by. So appreciate it. Uh, Roberts and Jenna's over to you. Uh, you got a minute roughly? James 2. Yeah. Um, exegeting a whole chapter is difficult in you know, 20 minutes, let alone one minute. So, <laughs> um, there's this notion in um, Bob's understanding, and among many Protestants, that once you push the faith button, then the works conveyor belt just automatically runs. And that is totally false. You can have faith just like the devils uh, have faith. James says, that's not going to do it for you. You have to add works to faith. They're not going to come automatically. They're just, they're just not going to flow from your faith. If that were true, then James wouldn't have to give his little epistle there in James chapter 2 to encourage these people to help the man who's naked and needs food. They would do it automatically, but they don't. So this is the whole Catholic teaching these works don't come automatically. You have to add them. And if you don't add them, like Abraham added them, then you will not be justified. Okay, that's the message of James. And do you think James, uh, do you think Abraham enjoyed bringing Isaac up to the altar and sacrificing him before God? Not at all. He had to force himself to do that work, to obey God. And this is what we have to do as Christians. We have to continue to work at our salvation by doing good works. Okay, appreciate it. Let's move on to the next one. Another um, question pertaining to exegesis. So why don't we be fair and, and give you both between one and two minutes. Let's just make sure we don't exceed two minutes, especially because this uh, specific verse is uh, or verses are, are a little heavy. So can both gentlemen please exegete Romans 4, 2 to 4. And uh, Robert, how about we start with you this time, uh, to be fair, and then we'll go with Bob right after. All right, hold on one second. Okay, um, I'm not going to read the passage, but I'm going to um, sum it up. Uh, as I said before, Paul is talking to the Jew who thinks that he's owed salvation because he's a child of Abraham. And the whole point here is to show that Abraham was justified long before he was circumcised. So it has nothing, salvation has nothing to do with being a Jew. Salvation has to do with believing in God, which is what Abraham did. He believed. Abraham didn't work. And like the Jew does and say, well, I'm going to do these sacrifices over here, God. And because of that, you owe me salvation. It's a done deal. No, Abraham didn't think that way. And David didn't think that way. And David is used as an example here as well. Um, they, Abra, uh, David repented of his sin before God. And then God justified him. Abraham believed without doing any of the ritual works that the Jews believe in or he didn't even believe circumcision was going to save him because he was circumcised after he believed. Paul makes a point of that in Romans 4, verses 11 and 12. Okay, so the, so the whole thing is here, look, if you think you can get to God by working as if he's an employer and he has to pay you with salvation, forget it. You can never be saved that way or justified that way. God will accept works, but on his terms, not your terms, okay? First, he wants to see you have faith, that you really believe in who he is, his whole vision for the universe, and everything he talks about. And once you establish that, 
that kind of a relationship with God, where you actually believe in him, then you can start working. And if you do start working, you're not going to work on a wage basis. You're going to work on a grace basis. And whatever God gives you because of your work, it's going to be by a reward, not because he owes you anything. That's the gist of Romans 4. Robert, appreciate the response. And that was exactly two minutes. So, Bob, we'll give you equal time, uh, up to two minutes. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, in four one, he's saying, what is Abraham, our father, found? And he says in verse 2, 4, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I think Robert missed the point that justification before uh, that in Romans 4, 2 is before men, not before God. And Robert wants to say that it's by faith apart from works, and it's by faith plus works. I find this confusing. He thinks it's not by the works of the law of Moses, but it is by the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. I don't understand how he can somehow make Romans 4, 2, 3, and 4 fit within the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. Notice verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's his justification before God. Verse 4, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So Abraham did not get justification before God by works. It was a grace gift. And that's the way we all get it. And we can't get it through marriage or through communion, the Eucharist, through penance, through last rites. We can't get it through baptism. We can't, the Catholic Church can't give it to us. Jesus gives us everlasting life to whoever believes in him. John 3.16. Okay, appreciate the response there, Bob. Uh, to the audience, uh, some fantastic questions. So here's the next one that comes in, and um, we've got. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert. Don't I get a one minute rebuttal on that? Good question. That one was also just for the both of you. So the first two questions was oh. just like a question for the both of you. Um, <laughs> I understand we could probably engage these ones all day. You're lucky. Uh, but we still do have more cross exams, so I'm sure we can get to that uh, there. But now we do have a few questions, actually, that are going to be directed uh, specifically at Bob and then a few specifically at uh, Robert. So this one comes in from the Layman's Seminary. How does uh, Wilkin understand the substantival participle in uh, John 3.16? I hope I didn't butcher that. Yeah, it's a, a substantival participle. And... Uh, in, in John 3.16, it's ha pistuon. And a substantival participle, the word substantival means it's a verb that's being used as a noun with an article in the front of it. So ha is the pistuon believing one. And so ha pistuon means the believer. And in John 3.16, the moment we believe, we are ha pistuon forever. We are the believer. In the same way, John the Baptist in Scripture is called ha-baptizon, meaning the baptizing one. But he's still John the Baptist 2,000 years since he did his last baptism. Once you believe, you are ha-baptizon. Thank you, Bob. Right on the one-minute mark. Appreciate it. Over to uh, Robert. You uh, also have a minute. Go ahead. Uh, there's really nothing here. Um, the Greek constantly uses the substantival participle to designate a particular uh, person, place, or thing that they're talking about. It sort of isolates it. it. You know, instead of saying the believer, it just says the one believing. So that's just the way the Greek uh, sometimes formulated their grammatical structure. So it really doesn't do anything here. Now, theologically, um, but that wasn't the question. You know, what, what is the theological meaning of this uh, uh, participle? Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go into it. Okay. Appreciate that, uh, Robert. Bob, if there's a quick final word you wanted to have since it was your question, you can go ahead. Well, I think another place we could look is John 11:26 because it's got two substantival participles joined by the word and or chi. And it says, the one who lives, ha zone, chi, the one who believes, ha pistuon. 
And just like we don't have to live forever in order to have everlasting life, we don't have to believe forever to have ever. Once you find a living human being who believes in Jesus, you found someone who will never die. John eleven twenty six. Okay, um, thank you, Donnie. Uh, sure. You gave you gave him a uh, second comment on his own question, and when I asked you for a second comment, you said no. We, we well, were just going back and forth with questions, and that was it. So. No, that's a good point. The The first two questions were just questions for the both of you, as in like, can the debaters exegete James 2? Can the debaters exegete Romans 4? So there wasn't really like it wasn't specific to anybody. So that's why we just had you both exegete it and then move on. All now right. we have a few... <laughs> OK, well, and, and that's why James 2, Robert, you got the last word there. So that was nice. And then for Romans 4, Bob got the last word. So in a way, it's kind of worked out. <laughs> nice All right. I'll have okay. to figure out how to get it in there somehow. But anyway, no worries. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we will. I appreciate you guys being a good sport and being fair. So, uh, but this one is for you, Robert. So you're going to get the All last right. word here. Taylor K. Uh, question for uh, Robert. Why did the thief on the cross go to heaven? Did he have works? It seems like it was faith alone. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, this is, this is the, the, part of the Protestant theology where you try to make the exception the rule, okay? There is always going to be exceptions to how people are saved. Maybe how are, you know, are aborted babies saved? Um, are uh, babies that uh, did receive baptism, are they saved? Um, uh, you know, all kinds of questions you can bring up because there's little cracks in the theology that either the Bible doesn't cover, the church doesn't cover, you know, they're always going to be there. OK, so what I would suggest here is let's just say the thief was um, saved by his faith. Is that the rule of the Christian faith that uh, we're saved uh, by our faith? Or was just this a special circumstance in that his hands are literally tied behind his back and he can't do any works? And Jesus is going to say, well, I'm sorry, you can't do any work, so I'm, you can't uh, go to heaven. Um, see, yeah, see, this is just cut and dry, black and white, uh, no exceptions. Um, and that's it. Sorry, chum. Is that Christianity? No, obviously not. Jesus is showing that in the circumstance, yes, he will make an exception to the rule. And it, but as far as the Catholics are concerned, if he was infused with faith, then he would have been infused with, um, hope and love at the same time. The only thing he doesn't have here is baptism in order to serve as the vehicle. Okay. So if his faith was real, there may be a chance that he had hope and love, which is the requirement that the Catholic Church uh, has for going to heaven. Okay. So there, if you want to start making exceptions by the thief on the cross, well, we can make some theological exceptions based on what we know of what's required to be saved. OK, but the general rule is you don't make rules from the exceptions. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate the response. Bob, over to you. You got one minute. And who was the questioner? Uh, the questioner was uh, the questions are flying in, so I may have lost right. it. OK, well, that's fine. Um, what I would suggest is, first of all, did he go to heaven uh, that day, no. He went to paradise. Paradise was Luke 16, 19 to 31. It's the saved part of Sheol or Hades uh, where Abraham's bosom was. No one went to heaven other than Enoch and Elijah prior to Jesus' ascension to heaven at, on 40 days after his death and resurrection. Secondly, did he do works? Of course. He's the only one at the cross that says this is an innocent man other than centurion that says this is a righteous man. This is the son of God. So he's clearly confessing Jesus before men. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, he who confesses him before men, him will I confess before my father who is in heaven. So this man did something rewardable. Did he believe? Of course he did. Notice what he said. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He believes Jesus is going to rise from the dead. Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. Jesus is the Messiah, King of Israel. And Jesus has guaranteed his eternal destiny so that he will be in the kingdom because he believes in Jesus, Messiah. 
but he wants rewards. And Jesus says, you will be with me today in paradise. And the emphasis is on the with me, the close association with Jesus. And the implication is that will carry through forever. You will have close association with me. And coming back to one of the points that Robert likes to bring up a lot, there may have only been a few hundred people watching at the foot of the cross, but billions of people know about this experience. And the truth is this man is one who stood up for Christ at the cross and spoke for Christ at the cross. Okay, thank you, Bob, for the response. Uh, Robert, a question was for you. My good man, you get a uh, last-minute response. On that particular question? Yes, yeah. Um, can I answer a previous question? Because I've already answered this question. If Bob's okay, I, I, yeah, I, sure. Let's. Uh, I, I, we're easy going here, so <laughs> <laughs> this has been fun. This has been fun. Great debate. Romans four. Um, Bob says that Abraham was justified before men. Um, no, that was not. That's not what Paul is saying in Romans four. God is the one who justifies, not men. Second, he wanted to know about the sec uh, seven sacraments. He says, Why, how are they any different than Jewish works? Here's how, Bob, let me explain it again to you. Because if you as a Jew try to do your works on an obligation basis, that is uh, trying to put God in debt to pay you for your works, you're not going to be justified. If you do your seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, you're not going to be rewarded based on a wage, based on the fact that God's your employer. You're going to be rewarded because God is a gracious, benevolent giver who accepts your works because he's gracious, not because he owes you anything. You need to get that distinction in your mind. If you don't, you'll never understand Catholic soteriology. Thank you, uh, Robert, and thank you, gentlemen, for keeping these responses to a minute. I, I know they're not, it's not always easy, so I want you both to feel uh, that it is fair and, and you're both able to make all the points you'd like to make. So uh, here's the next question that comes in from the Layman's Seminary. Charles, appreciate it. Um, he did say this one was specific to Bob Wilkin. So here we go. His question is, is justification before men the same thing Tony Evans and others refer to as horizontal? And if so, does it have to really be before men since it related to temporal representation? Okay. I'm not sure I understand the latter part of the question, but um, if I, I don't remember Tony speaking about this, he's a friend of mine, but I think uh, by horizontal, he would be between men. And yes, I would see justification before men as a uh, horizontal relationship with other men where they recognize that Abraham is a righteous man. They realize he's a friend of God, that sort of thing. And that's true today. If someone recognizes that a person is living a godly life, then they can be justified or vindicated before men. Now, as far as the last part of his question, I don't think I understood it. If it was about temporal what? Uh, he says temporal representation. Yeah, I'm not sure what temporal representation means, but yes, God blesses the one who is living for him now, and he will bless them with mythos, with rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, and forever those who are faithful will be rewarded. Okay, appreciate the response there, Bob. Charles, thanks for the question. Robert, over to you for your response. Um, I would just reiterate that none of these justifications of Abraham are before men. Genesis 15, 6, in the context, God shows Abraham the stars of the heaven, the sands of the sea, and says, your descendants will be of this number. And it says, Abraham believed God. God was the only one there talking to him. Okay. Genesis 22, the only one on the mountain was God witnessing, or you could say the angel was there, but that's not a man. Uh, God uh, witnessing Abraham attempting to sacrifice Isaac. God is the only one is there. God is the only one accepting the justification. That is, God gives him the justification because of those acts, of those beliefs. Now, you can say, 
if you want to include the rest of the world on a horizontal level, you can say men believe in the justification of Abraham because God first accepted it. That's why the men believe it. If God hadn't accepted it, no men would have believed Abraham was justified. So the whole thing, again, pivots on God, not man. This has just been a, uh, a red herring that Bob has thrown out that we have to go watch run around the track, but it means absolutely nothing. Robert, thank you for the response. Uh, Bob, for this one, you, you get the final minute. If you'd like it, go ahead. Okay. I would say the red herring's being thrown out by Paul, and the reason it's a red herring is it's inconsistent with the second sa seven sacraments. And Romans 4.2 says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. That means if he was justified by works, which James says he was, then he has no ground for boasting before God. But that would mean that he has a ground for boasting before who? If there's nobody else but God, the angels, and men, it's going to be either the angels or men. He has a ground for boasting before men. And if you follow this word through the New Testament, Paul speaks of his boasting. Paul boasts about what Christ has accomplished through him. And uh, the whole point is you can't boast for your justification, but you can have a boast if you have lived righteously, then there is a ground for boasting before men. That's the point of Romans 4.2. Okay, Bob, Robert, thank you for uh, engaging these questions and very thorough answers. So next one's for Robert. So uh, Robert, we're going to give you the final minute on this one. And this one comes in from Good News Gospel. Appreciate the question. And I got it up on screen. Abraham was way before the law and he was justified by faith in God. So why does Rome want to go back to the law that Christ fulfilled? I don't know what the question is asking because Rome doesn't go back to the law. Um, the, the point here is that Abraham was given a command of God to go sacrifice his son. That's the law. That's the law of the day. Okay. Abraham has to make a decision. Am I going to obey it or not? He obeys it. And because he obeys it, God justifies him. That's what James chapter two says. Okay. It's very simple, all right? Now, as far as Romans 4 and boasting, of course, if Abraham's going to boast before men, but that's not going to justify him. The whole point is that Abraham doesn't want to do it before men. He wants to do it before God because God is the only one that can justify him, okay? So again, this red herring of the men is clouding the issue. Only God justifies and obviously, if God's justifying it by grace, justifying Abraham by grace, and not because he owes him anything, we have a whole different category. So obviously, Abraham can't boast and say, hey, I work for God, and he paid me because he owed me. That would be boasting. But you can't do that because God gave it by his grace. So therefore, there is no boasting. When Paul is boasting, he, saw, he says, I could boast about this or that, but I don't. And that's because he doesn't want to uh, make himself look like he's some big hotshot that these people have to bow down to. That's why he doesn't boast. It's a whole different context than what Romans 4 is talking about. Okay, thank you, Robert. And uh, Bob, over to you for your response. Well, I find Robert's position and the Roman... Catholic position confusing because on the one hand, if I understood you correctly, Robert, you just said that justification before God is not by law and that you've never said it's by law. Then you turned around and you said, but I believe that Romans 2.13 is speaking the truth when it says not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So the issue for Robert is not whether we're justified by law, it's just which law. It's He doesn't think we're justified by the law of Moses, he thinks we're justified by the law of the Roman Catholic Church, or maybe the law of the New Testament, or maybe the church councils, uh, whatever is inspired within Catholicism. 
But the point is, justification before God is not by law. In Romans 3, 21 to 31, Romans 4, 1 to 8, Galatians 3, 6 through 14, it all makes it clear. Thank you, Bob. Robert, over to you. Uh, go ahead. Hello, yeah. Lord. Johnny, I, I plead for just 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. The question was for you. So you. Um... Oh, OK. So I have a full minute. Yeah, you got a full okay, minute. Go ahead. OK, finally got that in there. All right. Look, see, this shows me Bob doesn't understand the Catholic faith. That's why he's, he thinks it's confusing. Yes, Abraham obeyed a law. How was he justified from obeying that law? Because God owed him something for obeying the law? No. God justified him by his grace because he saw Abraham's sincere obedience to the law God laid down. And Bob either refuses to see that distinction or doesn't want to see it. The distinction is between God having to do something by um, being an employer, let's say, as opposed to God doing something because he's being gracious. Abraham can obey any law he wants. And if he sticks it in God's face and says, you owe me, God says, I don't know you a thing. But if he brings it to God humbly and asks for God's mercy and says, here, I obeyed your law, God will have mercy on him and justify him. That's the difference. Okay, perfect. Right on a minute. So I appreciate it. Next question. Um, we'll do one for uh, Bob now. We have a healthy mix of questions for uh, Bob and Robert. So this one uh, for you, Robert Wilkin, comes in from Praise I Am. Thank you for the question there, Praise I Am. He asks, how does Robert Wilkin feel about Colossians 1, 22 to 23? which says that we will be justified only if we continue in the faith. Doesn't that imply sanctification slash discipleship is necessary for salvation? Okay, if you look at Colossians 1, 21 through 23, Paul says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's the judgment seat of Christ. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. The point here is, in order for us to be presented by Christ as having been holy and blameless and beyond reproach, we must persevere in faith and good works. And the same point is found in 1 Corinthians 15 too. He talks the gospel which I preach to you, by which you are being saved, that is being sanctified, being made spiritually healthy, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you. Unless you believed in vain, which would mean if the resurrection didn't occur as he goes on in 1 Corinthians 15. So this passage is about sanctification, but not to get into the kingdom. It's to be presented by Christ as one who had done well. So he will say, well done, good servant. Okay, appreciate it, Bob. That is one minute, and we're going to hand it over to Robert. You got, uh, you got your minute. Go ahead. See, this is the fallacy of the whole Protestant theology. Any passage that talks about continuing in the faith or continuing in, in works uh, or being judged by works or things of that nature, all, what the Protestants do is they classify that as not the judgment for your sins, but the judgment to see what kind of rewards you're going to get in heaven, which implies that you've already made it to heaven. Now it's just a, a matter of what kind of re, how, how much status you're going to have in heaven. You see, but the New Testament never does that. It never takes all these passages that judge for your for your works and says, "Oh, they just they just refer to the rewards you're going to get." It has nothing to do with your salvation. Read First Corinthians chapter three, verses thirteen to seventeen. That will fix this problem real easy, because there you're judged by your works, and in verse seventeen you can end up in hell if your works are judged to be not so good. That is mortal sins, for example. Okay, so in Second Corinthians five ten, same thing. We're we're judged. We sit. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for our 
good and bad deeds, all that. See, what the Protestants do will say, oh, well, that's just for reward. You see, it has nothing to do with your salvation. That is a damnable lie. All of them have to do with your salvation. Robert, thank you for the uh, response. Bob, go ahead. You get the uh, one more minute. Okay, I wrote a book with Sondervan called Four Views on the Role of Works at the Final Judgment. I was the only one in the group who said there will be no final judgment for the believer, John 5, 24. The Catholic said there would. The Anglican said there would. The Calvinist, who teaches at Southern Seminary, said they would. I'm not sure what Protestants Robert knows, but 90% of Protestants take Colossians 1, 21 to 23 to say, if you persevere in faith and good works, then you're going to keep your salvation if they're Arminian, or you're going to prove you were saved if they're old line Calvinist, or you're going to win final salvation if they are the new Calvinist. Almost nobody in Protestantism takes this passage as dealing with the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, when I wrote that book, all three guys said that's the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is another name for the great white throne judgment. So, Robert, I'm not sure where you get that, but my views are not the same as the views of 90-some percent of Protestants. Okay, appreciate it, uh, gentlemen. So now we've got one for uh, Robert Sungenis. And as we come really, really close to the 30 minutes now, uh, one super chat came in. The chat has been very lively, lots of uh, side uh, chat debates. And uh, Victory Street Ministry, unfortunately, I lost your question. If you could, please uh, repost it, and we'll make that one the last one before we get into uh, the final four rounds of, of cross-exam. So, and to the debaters, I, I appreciate you guys keeping this engaging and, and respectful. So Andy Whitaker, he asks, question for Sungenis. What does justified mean in Matthew eleven nineteen? Same word as in James 2. Yeah, well, significantly, this is not a justification passage, Matthew 11. Uh, Matthew is saying wisdom is justified by her children. And you could put in there the word vindicated. I would have no problem with that. And that's because this isn't a soteriological passage. This is a passage talking about wisdom. And wisdom is just vindicated by our children in the sense that wisdom, um, as an abstract um, process of thought, um, is vindicated, that is, made real by the very children that use wisdom. Okay? That's all it's trying to say. So... But to see, this is the, the problem Protestants will have is they will say, well, you see, because because a DKO can be interpreted as vindicated here. Well, let's just put that meaning back into James 224. Voila. Now we have Abraham is vindicated because of his works and not justified. So that answers that problem. No, see, that's not the way you interpret scripture. You don't t wrench things out of context from a gospel passage that's not talking about soteriology at all, and then jam it into another passage that's going to make it easier for you to accept the passage if you can twist its words. Okay? It's just not the way we do things. And that's one thing I've learned coming to the Catholic Church. The Catholics don't do that kind of thing with Scripture. Thank you, Robert, for your response. Bob, over to you for your response. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear that Robert thinks there's at least one use of dikaiao in the New Testament that refers to vindication. So I guess you're going back on what you said earlier, that it never refers to vindication, but we have one now. And the other thing I would point out is the real issue between what Robert's position is and what my position is, he said it earlier, is what scripture you consider the most important. That is the analogy of faith. In other words, is John 3.16 clearer, let's say, than James 2.14? Is John 5.24, let's say, clearer than Colossians 1.21 to 23? Uh, is John 11.25 to 27 clearer than Hebrews 6, 4 to 8? Uh, Robert's going to go to all the problem passages and determine his view, and then he's going to reinterpret John 3.16 or John 5.24 or John 11.25. 5 to 27 or Acts 16, 31 in light of his misunderstanding of the problem text. And so it really comes down to 
do we believe that the scriptures are clear? And is the gospel of John written for the unbeliever? John 20, 30 and 31. Is it telling us how to be born again? And if, if so, a hundred times he says it's by faith, by faith, by faith, and not by works. Thank you, Bob. And Robert, you get the final minute. Go ahead. Uh, look, scripture is easy on the one hand. It's very difficult on the other. If it wasn't so difficult, Bob, we'd all be one great big church and not divided into 46,000 denominations at last count in 2021. 20, uh, so, you know, <laughs> scripture, scripture. Um, as far as me missing things, um, I don't think so. Okay. That's why it took 775 pages to write not by faith alone. Every relevant verse is examined and fit into the big puzzle of what justification is, what salvation is. Um, as far as missing things, you know, I've seen you miss things all night. Okay. Now you're accusing me of saying that Dikaio couldn't uh, refer to vindication. I never said that. I just said it can't in James 2, 24. That was my argument not in Matthew 11, okay? Um, so, I mean, I, I'm at a loss to wonder what you think is missing from this whole thing. So um, hopefully you can do a better job at the end. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. We have one final question here, and then we're going to move into uh, the final four rounds of cross-exam where we can hopefully address any any hanging points and any final arguments. So here we go, Victory Street Ministry, uh, Super Chat, appreciate the support. And uh, this one's for you again, Robert. So uh, he asks, in Luke 7, 48, Jesus forgives a sinful woman's sins. What specifically did Jesus say, save the woman in verse 50? I can pull what it up. What specifically too. did Jesus say, save the woman in verse 50? So let's read that. Can I have my time so I can read this? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. I have no problem with that. Uh, you know what he told the woman who was called the adultery in John 8. He said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Okay, Jesus could say many things. It, in this context, her faith was the most important. That's what he needed to draw out of her first. Okay, with the woman who got caught in adultery, it was her sin that was the problem. So he concentrated on that. Okay. With, with uh, somebody else, it may be another problem he has to work on, okay? So this is the problem with how Protestants exegete Scripture. You take a verse out of context, and you make a conclusion out of it, that salvation can co only come by faith alone. But that's not what the rest of the Scripture teaches. You have to learn to take things in the context that they are given and give them the appreciation for why it's said the way it is in the context, not because you want to support some faith alone theology. Thank you, Robert. And Bob, over to you for your response. Okay. Well, I would say that um, it's not crystal clear what salvation is going on here. Um, we're dealing with her anointing him and her gratitude because she's been forgiven much. Probably this is talking about regeneration. But it could have been talking about healing. Often Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Your faith has healed you. Uh, the woman with the issue of blood touches the hem of his garment. Your faith has healed you. Now, some people understand when he says that because he uses sozo to have a double meaning. Your faith has healed you and your faith has given you everlasting life. But in any case, we come back to the analogy of faith. For Robert, since he already knows from the Catholic Church that it takes the second seven sacraments and abiding in them in order to get saved and stay saved, um, therefore, this can't mean that a person who believes in Jesus is saved once and for all. Maybe it could say, according to him, that they start on the path of salvation. He says that in his book, but not that they're going to be saved forever. Thank you, Bob. And Robert, you get the final word. Go ahead. Because that's not the context of the passage, okay? 
if the context of the passage was concerned about the end of time and what her status may be, then it would talk about it. Here it's only concerned about the initial stage of her salvation, period, end of story. If you want to go find out what happens in the future or what may possibly happen, there are many passages that take care of that. Like Romans 2.13, for example. It's the, the word justified there is in the future tense. The doers of the law will be justified, which implies that it's going to come at the end of time. Okay? So there you have it. It's extended. That's the context of that passage. Okay? But you think that's hypothetical. And that's because you don't understand that a doer of the law is not going to be given the wage of salvation. He's going to be given salvation by grace for doing the law. Okay? That's the distinction you need to admit to and accept or else this debate's going nowhere. Okay, thank you, uh, Bob and Robert, for a fantastic audience Q&A. We had about 100 questions come in, so this has definitely been uh, worth the wait. Great debate so far. And uh, everybody is excited to know that we still got uh, four more rounds of cross-exam. And um, those will be between three and four minutes each. And then uh, quick closing statements. And we're going to try and wrap it up around the uh, two and a half hour mark. So first round is... Uh, Bob, being the affirmative, we're going to have you uh, lead the way, asking questions to Robert, and then we'll go from there. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, Robert, in Revelation 20, 11 to 15, the great white throne passage, on what basis are people condemned forever? Are you asking me uh, from um, that passage or in general? From that passage. Um, for their sins. No, but I mean, on what basis are they condemned? Oh, because of their sins. And where do you find that in the passage? What verse? Uh, let me turn to it quickly here. You know, the part where it talks about nobody who commits adultery, nobody who... Um, That's not who, in the passage. Um, hold on a second. Um, then he told me, um, do not, this is verse 10 of 22. No, then he told me, 20, do not seal up the word 20, 11 to 15. Yeah. Right, 11 right, says right, throne judgment passage. Yeah. 11 says, let him who does wrong, continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile, that's, continue that's to do not, vile. That's not okay? Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said 22. Okay. Forgive me. All right. Okay. Uh, well, he, he reads in the books. Um, they, and what's they, in the books? What's in the books? They were judged according to what had what he had done. That's in verse 13. So that's works. Yeah. And what's the basis of condemnation? When you do bad works. Okay. And where does it say that? Well, what kind of what you think you're going to tell us that good works are going to get you to hell? No, I look at verse 15. What does it say? It said, if anyone's name was not found. OK, well, I OK, I see where you're going, but that has nothing to do with works. That's right. Okay. That's it's right. A it's a different issue. That's right. OK, but their name isn't found because they did bad works. That's the that's the point. But you notice their books opened and a book. And the, the determination of being cast into the lake of fire was not based on what was in the books. It was what was not found in the book. Oh, Bob, 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 you have to learn to connect these passages and stop taking them out of context. His name isn't in the book, obviously, because he did bad works. So his name was taken out, just like many other passages in the Bible tell us. I will remove your name from the books, as it says in the Psalms. Why? Because you did evil works. Okay, are, am I asking more questions at this point? Okay, uh, yeah. next, next question is, what does Revelation twenty two seventeen mean? Revelation twenty two seventeen. you wanna read that for me? Uh, yeah, Revelation twenty two seventeen says, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. That's doreon in Greek. What does that mean? 
What is taking the water of life freely? Yeah, it means exactly what I've been saying the whole night. That is, you don't go up to God with your works or your faith for that matter and say, hey, God, you owe me. God says, no, I don't owe you a thing. I give it to you by grace. Or you can use the word dorayon if you want. Gift. It's a gift from me because I owe you nothing. Okay, let's say a person thinks that God owes him salvation because he's been working for God. Would that person miss out on the kingdom? Yes. Okay, so are you worried that you might think that God owes you salvation because of the works you have done, which you call gracious merit? In other words, you respond to God's gracious power and drawing and are you afraid you might think God owes you that? Oh, in my sin? Yeah, I might think that, but it's a <laughs> sinful thought. Okay, but God doesn't God owe people what he says he will give them? Like if he says, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. If I believe, isn't he obligated to give me everlasting life? Of course, it's not as a wage, but he is obligated to give it to me, right? That's the final question. Go ahead, Robert. God's obligated to himself. If God promised it, then God will follow through with it. Right. And that's the reason why he gives you the gift. It's not because he owes you anything. Those are two completely different things. Robert, you get to lead the way. Four minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, Bob, in Romans 2.13, which is our passage containing our, our resolution here, um, I, I still want to um, chip away at this and find out exactly what you believe in. Do you still believe that after I, I've explained that a man who is a doer of the law and is justified is not justified on the basis of debt that Paul condemns in Romans 4 verse 4, but is justified on the basis of God's grace for his obedience to that law? Do you understand that? Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, you seem to be saying that if a person is the doer of the law, then they will be justified. Is that correct? No, Bob. I want you to, I, I need to know whether you understand this or not. That if he is a doer of the law and God accepts his obedience to the law, it's based on God's grace that God accepts it, not because God owes the man something because of his obedience. Okay, so if God in his grace accepts his works as completing the law, then God will justify him, correct? Well, I don't know why you use the word completing the law. I just said obeying the law. Okay, obeying right? the law. I thought it had to be until the end of life. Well, it does, but I just want to That's make sure. That's what I mean by completing. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. okay, now, okay. You're a little, you're sly in answer, sometimes. In answer to your question, James 2.10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. Right, Bob. I agree. Here's why I agree. Because if someone is obeying the law and is, is thinking that he's going to get to heaven because God owes him, him heaven because he obeyed the law, the very, that very law is going to condemn him because God does not give heaven on a wage basis. He gives it by grace. All right. Are you asking the questions? I, if you are, I'm ready for another one. Well, you, you showed me that you didn't understand, so I wanted to reiterate the position. Do you understand it? Now, that's the question. Yeah, I've understood it all along. You have this view that somehow it's by grace, apart from works, but it's by grace through works. Ah, you see, now we're getting to it. See, this is why I don't say Romans 2.13 is hypothetical. You are forced to because you only have one view of works. They're bad. Or they can only become good after I'm saved. And uh, so that makes works sort of like in another category. I'm saying, no, we can't do that. Because works are not the evil thing that you portray them to be. Because you have to look at them in the right system. If works are done under God's grace, that's totally different than works being done under the, the uh, framework of debt and wage and paying you for what you do. It makes all the difference in the world if you have this understanding of works. 
And we just have 30 seconds left. So Robert, if you want to form that into a question, we'll give the last 30 seconds to Bob to uh, answer it. And then we'll move to the next round. Um, I'll concede my time. Okay. Bob, if there's anything you wanted to respond there, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what there is to respond to. He keeps coming back to the fact that it's a, it's a gift. It's by grace, but it's by faith plus works. That's a, a massive misunderstanding no. of the Old and New it, Testament. It's by faith and works because the works are rewarded by grace, Bob, not by debt. So is the faith. Your faith is a gift that God gives you. It's all by grace. Faith and works are all by grace. You know, I think by the end, you know that song, Bob, 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 Baran, Bob, 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 Baran. I keep thinking when I hear Robert saying my name four or five times in a row, he's going to break into that song. But OK. <laughs> uh, Bob, go ahead. We got uh, three and a half minutes left. And and uh, this is technically your your time to lead the way. So however right. you'd like to utilize that. If you are paid by your employer or by your ministry, is that a grace gift or is that a wage that you're paid? That's a wage. Okay. And it's because you work. Right. Okay. So there are some contexts in which being paid is a wage for work done. Oh, yeah. And if he didn't pay me, I could take him to court and sue him. Okay. It's all, it's all on a legal basis. Very good. Okay. Now you say on page 533 of Not by Faith Alone, Catholicism allows the individual to have confidence, but not certainty. And you put confidence in italics. Certainty implies presumption and audacity, unquote. Is it presumptuous to believe God? <laughs> Bob, I love how you twist, twist things. Um, no. Okay. I believe God. I believe every word he says. That's why I'm here debating tonight. What I don't believe is um, that I know the future and I can tell you standing here tonight that I'm never going to sin again or fall away from the faith. Uh, I just don't know that. I've always been bad at predicting the future. And uh, so that's why I can have confidence because I'm not just looking at today. I'm looking at the future up until judgment day. And then during that time from today until then, can I be absolutely certain that I'm going to be saved? The answer is no, because I may fall. And you know why I say that? Because this whole New Testament is replete with references to people falling away from the faith. Every book of the 27 books, except perhaps, except perhaps Philemon, talks about the possibility of falling from the faith. Yeah, we agree on that. It's just if you fall from the faith, you still retain everlasting life. But let me ask you whoa, another whoa, 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 Wait a minute. It's my <laughs> turn to ask what? Question. Let me ask you a question, Robert. Do you, share, do you, do you share your faith? Do you share your faith? All the time. And what do you tell someone they need to do to be saved? All that I've said tonight, Bob. I'm not so going to go How long does it take for you to evangelize someone? Uh, are we on a stopwatch or something? Well, I mean, could you do it in, let's say, an hour? Why would I want to do that, Bob? Okay, how about a, a week? Could you share the, in, in a week? It depends on the person and their disposition, how old they are, how much they know. Everybody's different, Bob. Okay, I got another question for you. You were, you did get a master's, right, from Westminster Theological Seminary? Yeah. That's a five-point Calvinist school? Sure is. Okay, so here's my question. Do you think do you find any similarities between your current view of justification and your view of justification when you were a five point Calvinist? Are there any similarities between the two? Um, I, I never really took stock of it, Bob. What's the point of the question? OK, let me ask you this. Do five point Calvinists believe you must persevere in order to get into the kingdom, persevere in faith and good works? Uh, depends on what kind of Calvinist you are. Have you ever met a Calvinist that said you didn't have to persevere? The fifth point of Calvinism, you know, yeah. a five-point Calvinist who said, I've met three, two or three, but have you met any? Um, I any may weapon? have, Bob. I don't really talk to Calvinists that much anymore, so I really don't know. So I'm still struggling with the relevance of your question. Did you used to believe in the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints? Yes, and I still do. 
Okay, so that's a commonality between your Calvinism and your Catholicism. No, because the Calvinists believe that your perseverance is predestined. The the Catholics have a um, sort of a um, hybrid understanding of that in the sense that you have to have the gift of perseverance in order to persevere. And so the gift of perseverance is actually another grace that God gives you so that you can complete your salvation. Whereas the Calvinists believe that it was already, you know, um, made in, in time past. Okay, thank time, you. Time, time. So, you. okay, here we go. Final round of this heroic debate. Uh, <laughs> Robert, you get to, uh, <laughs> we've had a huge chat and it's been hard to keep up with. Uh, but you guys are doing a fantastic job in, in here, uh, Bob and Robert. So final round, four minutes. Robert, you get to lead the way. Go ahead, gentlemen. Okay. All right. So, Bob, um, you said something startling to me in your last session there, which was, if I, if I had written it down correctly, I don't know. I hope I did. You said, after, after I said that every book of the New Testament talks about falling away from the faith, and that's why... I can only have confidence of my salvation, not absolute certainty. Um, you said, oh, yeah, I believe uh, the same thing. All those books talk about falling away from the faith. But you still have it. You, but you, then you continued and you said, but you still have everlasting life. So can you explain to us what you mean, first of all, by you can fall from the faith but still have everlasting life? Are we in his closing statement or are we still in questions? Oh, we're still in questions. So this okay, is the final fine. four minutes of questions. Great. Okay. Uh, my answer would be that the entire New Testament has filled with warnings about falling away from the faith. And if you fall away, you are going to reap consequences in this life and consequences at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans, uh, I mean, uh, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. That is, deny us the privilege of reigning. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The scriptures are clear that there is a danger to falling away. Perseverance is not guaranteed. But if we don't persevere, we retain the everlasting life. That's why if when you were at 19, if you, I don't know based on what you said, whether you believed in the free gift of everlasting life but if you did, you'd still be born again today, even though you've fallen away from the faith. Wow, Bob, you shocked me. You really shocked me by this one. Um, I'm going to reiterate it. You believe you can fall from the faith, but that has nothing to do with your salvation. Correct. All it, all it has to do with is some kind of repercussions you're going to suffer in this life. And some kind of repercussion you're going to suffer at the judgment seat of Christ, which is not a judgment for salvation. It's a judgment for reward, as right. I understand. And right. so you can fall a, a billion times in this life. And um, and th is this without repenting of those sins, Bob, that you fell from uh, that you've fallen from? I mean, you've fallen from your faith. Have you repented of that? And then you've come back to the faith or are you just saying point blank, you can fall from the faith and it doesn't matter whether you repent or not, you're, it doesn't affect your salvation? Yeah, I'm saying if you fall away from the faith morally or in terms of your belief system, you're still born again. Once you're born again, you're born again forever. Even if you fall away, even if you don't repent, even no matter what, if you join a different religion, whatever it is, Jesus said, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. The moment we believe we are secure forever. Okay, let's just take what Jesus said, point blank. If you believe in me, you have everlasting life. What if you stop believing? Doesn't the equation come out that you don't have everlasting life? No, because as we discussed before, it's an articular participle, which means the one who has faith, one who has believed, just like John the Baptist is still ha baptized zone. So the believer who stops believing is still ha pistuon. Once he believes, he is a believer forever. Wow. Okay. Um, to me, uh, you know, the debate's over. Once Bob says this, uh, it, it is absolutely this will be formal heresy in the Catholic Church to say that someone can fall and still be saved and, and still be saved without repenting once from any occasion that he fell. 
So um, I'll right. proceed the rest of my time. Um, whatever else we have, I don't know. Okay, Bob, if there's anything there you wanted to respond to, then we're moving into closing statements. Uh, my only thing I'd respond to is, didn't the council at Trent say that anyone who believes in justification by faith alone is under anathema? Yeah, five times. And has that been revoked by the later uh, popes? No, it never will be. So anybody that's listening that believes in justification by faith alone is going to hell unless they repent. No, I never said that, Bob. You did. Okay, what does it mean to be under anathema in the Council of Trent? It means you know exactly what the doctrine says. You've studied it. There's no ambiguity. There's no vagueness. There's You've been counseled by the church of what the right doctrine is, and you still refuse to believe it. Then you're a heretic. And if you died as a heretic, where would you go? You go to hell. So if there are people listening who, who are heretics, they believe in justification by faith alone, and they die as heretics, they're going to go to hell. Is that correct? But you would have to be declared a heretic by the Catholic Church officially. Oh, you mean God doesn't determine who's a heretic. The Catholic Church does. Wait a minute. You were just talking about the Catholic Church. I said nothing about God. God is a, is is. I know a, you said nothing about God. That's what I'm asking. Doesn't God determine who the heretic is? Yes, God makes the final judgment because He knows all things. But He He hands the judgment to the church to tell you in this life what your status is. If you believe in a false doctrine, you're a heretic. It didn't say you were going to go to hell. You could repent of that heresy for all they know. Okay, that's time. Uh, great job to the both of you. Uh, awesome chat tonight, tons of questions, very engaging debate. It really was one to remember. There's been a lot of hype for this. And again, it was worth the wait. So we do have uh, five minute concluding statements though, where we can wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. And Bob, you being in the affirmative, we are going to uh, give you the floor. You have five minutes for a concluding statement. Go ahead. Well, we've seen that when Paul says in uh, Romans 2.13 that it's not the hearers of the law who are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law who will be justified, he's speaking hypothetically. He makes that clear in Romans chapter 3. He makes that clear in Romans chapter 4, directly contradicting what he said in the earlier chapter, unless he was speaking in the sense that if a person could do that. We saw in James 2.10, that if a person stumbles in one point of the law, he's guilty of it all. And so all are lawbreakers. Romans 3.23, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Paul concluded that justification is a gift, not a reward for work done. Uh, Romans 4.4 4 and 5. He said the same thing in Galatians 2.16. He said a man is not justified by the works of the law. It's interesting in Romans chapter 4. Uh, in verse 5, Paul says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. It's funny he doesn't qualify for him who does not work. He doesn't say this is works where you expect a reward. This doesn't say this is work where you think God is obligated. It just says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. God doesn't justify the godly, as Robert says, he justifies the ungodly. And let's say that Robert got into the kingdom because he took advantage of the grace of God to empower and enable him to continue in faith and good works until he died. If that were the case, and he got into the kingdom, but I did not persevere in faith and good works. In fact, from what he said, if I continue to believe in justification by faith alone, well, then I'm going to the lake of fire. So it would seem that gives him about a ground for boasting. Robert wants to say, no, if you thought that God owed it to you, then you'd end up in the lake of fire. So it seems like a tricky position he has. You have to believe that if you persevere in faith and good works, you will make it. And if you don't, you won't. But if you do persevere in faith and good works, it's not because you persevered in faith and good works. It's because God gave you the gift of final salvation. I, I don't understand that. Um, the, Robert says that the good works that are needed, that we must persevere in, he calls them gracious merit on page 
81 and following of not by faith alone. Well, the word merit, according to the dictionary, means, quote, the quality of being particularly good or worthy, especially so as to deserve praise or reward, unquote. Well, there's no sense in which anyone merits everlasting life. We don't receive everlasting life because of gracious merit. We receive everlasting life as a free gift. And there are over 100 verses in the New Testament that say that. Robert's view today is essentially the view that he held when he was a Calvinist. It's the essential view of Arminians and Calvinists. It's the idea that unless you persevere to the end of your life, you're not going to make it into the kingdom. They have different ways of, of tweaking that, but they all hold the same view. You heard him say that if I say a person could fall away and they still are once saved, always saved, he said that's heresy. You're a heretic according to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that's his position. I took this debate today because I'm concerned about Robert's salvation and the salvation of anyone who believes like he does. Because if they're wrong, they probably think, well, you know what? I have faith plus works, so I'm going to make it if it's by faith alone. But they don't have faith because they don't believe John 3.16 or John 5.24 or Romans 4, 4, and 5. They don't believe it's a free gift and it's by faith apart from works. As a result, it doesn't matter how many good works they have. If their name's not in the book of life, they're not going to get into the kingdom. And to get in the book of life, one must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Luke 10, 20. Look at uh, Philippians 4, 3, both talking about the book of life. Jesus told the woman at the well, one drink. He told the people after the feeding of the 5,000, one partaking of the bread of life. It's not drink, 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 as Robert said my whole life. The moment I partake, at that moment, I have everlasting life that can never be lost. John 3.16 is clear. Whoever believes in him, if you're one of those people, then you're never going to perish, but you have everlasting life. It cannot be lost. If you're looking for free articles dealing with problem passages or clear passages, come to faithalone.org. And you can go to our YouTube channel, Grace Evangelical Society, for a bunch of short five to eight minute videos. Thanks. Bob, thank you so much for your five minute concluding statement. Uh, Much appreciated. Robertson Jenis, we're going to hand it over to you now. And you have your concluding statement. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Donnie. All right, so um, I have to deal with what Bob just said in my closing remarks. So, because we've talked about this stuff already, and I'm just going to sort of mop up. Um, Bob made the statement. He said that Romans 2.13 is hypothetical. That's the resolution he has to defend. Um, And he said that Paul makes this clear in Romans 3 and 4. Where does Paul say in Romans 3 and 4 that Romans 2.13 is hypothetical? That he didn't mean really, he, he laid all this out from Romans 2 verse 4 to 16 basically is the pericope of that passage. And in all that he's saying, you know, he's not a respecter of persons, to the Jew first, to the Gentile, whoever does. As a matter of fact, Romans 2, 6 and 8 basically says the same thing as Romans 2.13, which we should have read and we didn't read. So let me read that right now, because um, that's very important as far as context that Paul sets up. So he says here, um, in Romans 2, verse 6, oh, let's start with verse, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. So there you have it. Same thing as Romans 2.13. Who does good and God will give them eternal life? But to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. 
but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Does that sound like a hypothetical text to you? No. It's a context that he's setting up so that when he comes to uh, Romans 2.13, when he says, the doers of the law shall be justified in his sight, now it makes sense because the whole context he said before that says the same thing. So, again, the question is, where does Paul make it clear that this is hypothetical? He certainly doesn't do it in Romans 2. There is no statement in Romans 3 or 4 that what he just said was hypothetical. So where is it? You know, Paul does talk about being hypothetical in Romans 3, verse 3, when he's talking about the law and the oracles of God that the Jews kept. Uh, he says, you know, let, let me play the role of, and I'll be hypothetical at this point so I can make an argument. But that's the only place in the whole book of Romans that Paul says he's being hypothetical. And the fact that he has to tell you means that that's how you know. But he doesn't do it in Romans 2 at all. Okay, so um, he says that Romans 4.4 4, uh, does not qualify the fact of works or, or qualify anything having to do with works. It says a man who does not work. I understand that, but we're not going to Romans 4 in order to show where else Paul talks about having to do works. He just did it in Romans 2.13, okay? He does it uh, in, in uh, other passages as well. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we talked about that, okay? If you don't push that up to the reward category and it's dealing with salvation, well, yeah, that passage is very strong that Paul says you better do good works or else you're going to be judged, okay? We saw it in Re uh, Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12, or uh, Revelation 20, verse um, 13, it says, they were judged by their works. I mean, how much more information do you need to know that you're going to be judged by your works at the end of time? I mean, the, the, the New Testament is filled with passages like that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and he says that gracious merit, that I, I, I believe in this thing called gracious merit, but he believes in the free gift. Well, let me tell you, Bob, they're both the same thing. Okay. As I told you, the word, the Greek word mythos can mean um, something that you're you're uh, rewarded for good uh, on the good basis or on the bad basis. It's a neutral word. Okay, we're using it in the sense of um, uh, it has no connotation of being owed something. That's not what we mean here by merit. We mean gracious merit in the sense that it's a free gift. None of us deserve it, but God gives it because of his benevolence, not because he owes us. And I need to make that point clear because somehow it just wasn't registering. All right. So, uh, and then we can come back to this whole thing about, I believe you must preserve, uh, persevere in the faith. Well, <laughs> I don't know how else you could read the New Testament. I mean, if Bob believes that you can fall from the faith and you're still saved, even if you don't repent, well, I I give up. Okay, that, that as I said is a heretical statement, and it would never be accepted in the Catholic Church. And this is just another indication to me that as the denominations keep splitting and splitting and splitting, everybody's got their own interpretation of Scripture, and that's why we need the Catholic Church because it has the one truth that has been deposited from the apostles and Jesus throughout the fathers, the medievals, and until today. And we've had councils to back up everything that the church has taught, and it's never changed one of its doctrines. And that's how we know it's true. Okay, Robert, thank you for your closing statement. Again, to the debaters, I really appreciate uh, your time, and I appreciate you both doing this. So we're going to let you, Bob and Robert, we're going to let you gentlemen get out of here. You've earned the night off. I Thanks, stick around for a few minutes and give reminders. So again, All right. thank you so much for the debate. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. You're welcome, uh, Bob. And thank you, Donnie. Anytime, let me know. Yeah, and thanks, Donnie. All right. My pleasure. Peace out to everybody. Okay, God bless. I just...
All right, there we go. That concludes the much anticipated debate between two powerhouses in the world of soteriology and just the world of debates in general. Uh, both Robert Sengenis and Bob Wilkin are well read, well studied, well educated. And um, I've been looking forward to this one for a while and it did not disappoint. I told you it was be, it would be fast paced and it was um, pretty well cross exam the whole time. And everybody in the audience, I appreciate all the questions um, and so many good questions that, that kind of help the debate. Uh, move forward with uh, specific texts that we got to deal with, James 2, Romans 4. So this is definitely up there in, I think, one of the uh, better debates on, on this topic. So to Robert, to Bob, uh, great job. And I appreciate all the, uh, all the prep that was clearly done for this debate. Looks like there's going to be an after show a little bit, uh, a little bit later uh, tonight. If I am uh, correct, Charles Jennings, I think, is having it. And it'll be, I believe, at 11 p.m. EST. But if I'm wrong, let me know in the chat, guys. Uh, Talking Christianity says, uh, yeah, definitely check it out. Um, we agreed upon two and a half hours and bam, it was the two and a half hour mark when, when the debate ended. So... Uh, great endurance from the debaters. Anyways, a couple reminders. The fun continues. So we've got uh, main event after main event after main event. Honesty Angel Sister says definitely have to watch again. Yes, I look forward to uh, sitting back tonight with a coffee and re-listening um, where I'm not actually uh, moderating. So and I appreciate the kind words and I do the best I can as moderator. I just want the debaters to feel like uh, it is fair, and they are getting as much time as they need to make their point. So we have another uh, epic soteriology debate in two days. Uh, two more seasoned debaters, Francis Turretin, Joshua Gibbs, Lordship, Free Grace, Do Christians Persevere to the End? So this one should be interesting. Both of uh, these gentlemen, both of these debaters believe in eternal security. But uh, the debate is going to uh, focus specifically on the extent of one's sanctification. Can a believer uh, fall away uh, or will all believers endure to the end? So two days, Josh Gibbs, Francis Turretin, that is going to be a ton of fun. Also coming up on the 14th, a lot of hype for this one. This one's going to be an early debate. So um, I'm going to make sure I am fully prepped with coffee. <laughs> so uh, Nick and uh, Kent and myself are all on uh, completely different time zones, but this is this one's going to be good. The 14th, the Evolution Debate Challenge Series continues. We've done close to 30 of these now this year. Evolution on Trial, Nick and uh, from the Planner Walk uh, channel, and uh, Kent a.k.a. Dr. Dino. So that one is, is coming up next, next week. A few more on the Evolution Debate Challenge series. Dr. Dino, Snake Was Right. Dr. Dino, Wade the Wizard, Endgame. Dr. Dino, Atheist Jr. So Kent's a busy man. We put out this challenge at the beginning of 2022, and it has been prolific. We have uh, hosted so many of these uh, evolution challenge debates. So if you're an evolutionist, you want to take the challenge, you know that we, uh, we make sure these debates are professional, equally timed, civil, and sophisticated. Last couple things I do want to mention is uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman. He will be back here first thing in July. Presentation on SFT, C.S. Lewis, anti-Darwinist anti-evolutionist. So this is going to be very interesting. And I am, uh, I'm pumped for that one. Jerry Bergman is a blessing. And last thing I want to say, uh, the endogenous retrovirus handbook, the limited edition is available on Amazon and you can see them behind me. The cover is awesome. Benjamin did a fantastic job. So, uh, what are you waiting for? 
This is a must-have, must-read book, and you can find uh, the links to the book, I believe, in every single description box of our videos, and it'll take you right to the Amazon website, and just make sure to uh, grab your limited edition version. should be available for another uh, week or two, and I think that's pretty much it. Let me just have a uh, quick look in the chat, uh, Talking Christianity, Josh Gibbs. Good to see you, brother. So we will be uh, seeing you shortly. Anyways, we've had a fantastic chat, almost 200 people uh, for this uh, heroic, much anticipated debate. Bob Wilkin, Robert Sungenis, if you're not yet subscribed, but you love debates, you love interviews, you love lectures, you love conferences, then make sure to hit that subscribe button, share around this content because the truth is important and why we host so many of these debates over 180 now is because we strongly believe in critical thinking. So there's no better way to uphold and promote critical thinking by getting together the best debaters in the world, essentially with some of these debates and uh, seeing both sides, engaging both sides in a sophisticated manner. So that being said, thank you so much, everybody. That's all that comes to mind. Share around this debate. This debate was a ton of fun. I look forward to re-listening. And until we meet again, God bless. Standing for Truth is out.